Hi guys, welcome back to another video. As you can see here, I've been very busy. I made some changes in the corner of the workshop here. So what I'll do today is we're gonna run through wiring up the VFD, testing it out, hooking it up to the spindle, making sure everything's working there. And then I'm gonna give you a little rundown of some of the electronics and the installation here of the control box on the wall behind me. So let's dive straight into it. Right guys, first significant update is obviously I've received delivery of this electrical enclosure. Like I said, I ordered a nice one, high quality, steel construction, should be perfect to house all the components for this machine. Comes with a nice little key here to unlock it. And inside, you see we've got our nice earthing and everything there that we can wire up to the mains. And I've already put a few components in there. I think I am probably going to go with the steppers this way up. And this has a back plate already in it. So what I'll probably do is cut a wood board roughly the same size as this. And then bolt that down to the steel back plate. That way I'll be able to get everything on and they'll all be insulated from each other. Really, really pleased with this. It does live up to the spec given on the website and I'm looking forward to installing everything. So obviously this is sort of weather proof grade. I'm not really gonna need that, but I am obviously gonna have to cut some holes in here for a fan mount somewhere because these components need air. You can't just close them in a sort of airtight box and expect everything to play happy. The VFD has a fan on it. The two power supplies here, this one has a fan. This one doesn't, but they still need to be able to cool. The steppers will generate heat too. And if I've got a little PC in there as well, you know, you want a nice airflow. So what I'll probably do is have a natural airflow where I'm drawing in from the bottom and just naturally have that heat rise up and out the top here of the box. So I might have an intake fan and an outtake fan. Depends what kind of air pressure I want to achieve, whether I want a positive air pressure inside or negative. You can play around with that in the future. You could have two smaller fans down here maybe, and just some vent holes at the top even. It's completely up to you what you want to do. So what I'm actually thinking of doing is mounting this on the wall of my workshop so it's up out of the way, sort of up above the machine behind it where I've got some shelves at the moment and then potentially having some quick connect cables for each of the axis. That's something I am thinking about doing. And also for the sensors too, so that if I ever wanna disconnect the machine and move it away, the box can stay on the wall and I just have to pull out the connectors and then obviously put them back in when I wanna use it. So I'm gonna explore that, see what that entails. It means I'm gonna have to buy a few more connectors. So, I'll sort of try and put it together as best as I can, see what needs ordering, how much it's gonna cost, and go from there. The other alternative would be to mount it to the back of the machine, to the actual base of the CNC frame here. That's another perfectly feasible option. So the downside of putting it on the wall may be a bit of extra cost to get the cable extensions. So we'll see how it goes, and I'll sort of weigh up the options as I progress. One of the things we're gonna to do today is do some basic testing on our VFD, just to make sure it works and also that our spindle motor works. That's a good thing to sort of have peace of mind when you order this and you not, haven't necessarily built the machine yet. You want to try and test your components as quick as you can, like I said before, just in case you need a replacement. Generally, a lot of companies tend to frown on replacing things when they were bought sort of three months ago particularly if you're buying from China, like AliExpress and that type of thing. So my advice would be, as soon as you get your components, run a dummy test straight away, make sure they work. So again, for this one I'm gonna be doing today, I've got my sort of testing plug that I made from the last video. I've got my wire terminals on here now, which I've crimped on. And what I'm gonna do is connect this up to the VFD and then we're gonna connect our VFD out to our spindle so that we can make sure it works and make sure we can control it from here. My particular VFD here has a cover on the bottom which you can flip open and in there you can see a whole bunch of different connectors. On the top here, 
we have our connectors that you would interface to a control board. The bottom ones here are the power connectors which are our power input from the wall or your fuse or wherever it's coming from. These are also the inverter output which go directly to the spindle. So I'm going to show you how I wire this up today. Again like I said in the last video you are responsible for your own wiring. I'm based in the UK and the colors of your wiring may not match the coloring of my wiring in this video. So again be aware of that. So I've propped up the VFD here so you can get a better look inside. So if you look here on the bottom panel we've got N which is neutral, we've got L which is live, then we've got W, V and U which are the inverter outputs. W, V and U are outputs to the spindle. We've then got FG which is ground or earth. The spindle also has an earth so the spindle actually has four outputs which is why you require the four core cable and then this plus DB here is to do with a break-in resistor. We're not worrying about that now but what we're going to do is focus on these. So just like before I'm going to wire up the neutral, the live and the ground Again, in the UK, brown is going to be my live, our neutral is the blue, and the earth here is my green and yellow. So I'll connect those up now. You want to do these up nice and tight, and it's very important that with these you actually use the proper connectors. This draws so much power you don't want to be just throwing in bare wire in there that can potentially be pulled out very easily. These clamp down very nicely. They also have these nice plastic surrounds here to help insulate from each other. So I'm going to put on the live now as well. There we go, we've got our neutral, our live, and this is going to be our earth, which obviously goes over here to FG. I'm going to leave that one there for now. I'm not going to connect that up just yet, because the other cable here also connects to the earth, so they're going to double up. Now, your spindle will have certainly come with a product manual, just like this one. There's loads of different models. Yours is maybe different to mine depending what setup you bought. Now you must read this. Read it three, four, even five times, right? Make sure you understand this before you do any kind of wiring. Like I said, this is dangerous, potentially. You want to make sure that you're putting things in the right place. This little book is great. You can see we've got little tables here like this one, which explain what all these different outputs are. And we've also got circuit diagrams it also tells you some of the characteristics of the VFD itself, what it's capable of, what inputs it's expecting, what outputs it's expected to give. And this is something you, you know, seriously want to read and have a real good look at. It also explains how to operate the VFD, how to use it, how to set it up initially, how to control it with a potentiometer. And that's something else I'm going to try and show you as well. Um, connecting this up to the Mac 3 board will require an additional board, which I'll talk to you about later on. But for now, we just want to try and get this running and make sure it works. So please do go and read this. It's very important. Right, okay, so now let's talk about the spindle wiring. Now, this cable that I've got here is a 4-core cable. This one is unshielded but I would highly recommend you use a shielded cable for your final wiring. This is just for testing here, I had this cable lying around, so I just want to make sure this works, so this is what I'll be using. So this diagram here is taken from the manufacturer website or the selling page that you buy this from. Now, it's really important that this is the correct diagram for the model that you have. And what this shows you is all the different inputs and outputs here and what they represent. We've particularly got the main ones at the bottom here, which like I said, we've got neutral, live, we've got our ground or earth over there. Now this cable here, as you can see, 
has four different connections on it. Now this is the female end and obviously the male end is over on the spindle. Now this connector has different notches on it so you can't possibly put it into the spindle in the wrong orientation. It'll only go in one way. Now I don't know how well you can see on the camera but these do have corresponding numbers. Now they're not numbered very well. It's not obvious to tell whether you know this one here is three or four. It, it's, the numbers are just either side of the port which is kind of silly in my opinion. But if you go and look at the diagram generally from what I've seen online one tends to be in line with the biggest notch here which would be this one. So what we'd have here is one, two, three, four. And this diagram tells us where they all go. So one goes to U, two goes to V, three goes to W, and four goes to the earth or the ground. If we look at what I've done here with the wiring, so this whole unit here will be a part of the spindle. The way it works is this just screws onto this tightly and then this part screws onto the top of the spindle so it's very secure. So I'm going to take this back off. There's a rubber seal here at the back as well because obviously the spindle is water cooled so my guess is that that's to prevent any water getting down there in the event of an accident. But you can pull this back gently. This rubber seal does move so if you just pull it back like this. So one thing to bear in mind here is that this diagram here is reference to this orientation like this. So we've got one, two, three and four. So you'd want to wire this up in the same way and it's important that you know what colors your wires are. So what I do is I'd write them down on a piece of paper so that you know you've wired U here which is pin one as in my case is gray. So I know that the gray cable coming in goes to pin one and I know that the grey cable on the other side represents pin one which will come on this end. What I've also done is I've added some shrink wrap here for insulation. These need to be insulated from each other as best as possible so before you do the wiring slide on your heat shrink tubing make the solder joint to these connectors slide the tubing over and then just heat it up and that will tightly grab that and that just prevents potential any arcing or short circuiting between any of these. Better to be safe than sorry on that one. When soldering them I'd recommend you tin the connector end first and then the wire end so that you've got as much solder on each as you can and then just bring them together, heat them up and they'll just stick nicely. It is quite a tricky job which is why I didn't film that one. Soldering's hard enough anyway, you need about five hands to do it. So uh, I just did that last night while I had a bit of time. Quite a straightforward process. Just get the pins lined up correctly. So once you've done your soldering, this simply slides back down. Get it into position. You would screw it on. Nice and tightly. And then you also want to make sure you clamp this down. So this is a essentially a cable grip, right? You tighten this down, it really grips onto the cable so that in the event that this gets yanked, it doesn't rip those connections off. This is kind of gripping it here. Because if them connections were ripped off while there's power, chances are they meet and short and you wouldn't want that to happen. So you want to clamp this down as tightly as you can. Now at the other end here, like I said, make a note of which color wire was which pin. Now you always want to go, you know, keep keep in tune with what you've used already. You know, I know the ground or the earth here is yellow and green, so I kept that one for yellow and green in that case. You can just help when you're visually checking it over. You can be confident that that's correct. And is why I didn't secure that one down yet, because these both need to go on the same terminal. So in my case here, grey represents pin 1. I've then got black, which represents pin 2. I've got brown, which represents pin 3. And pin 4 is earth or ground, which obviously goes into FG. So I'm going to connect those up now as well.
Remember, don't just blindly follow the video. Your colors are going to be dependent on which Y you have and which pin they represent. So mine may not necessarily correspond to yours. Okay, so our first one here is W, which in my case represents the brown wire. So that's going straight in there. And I'm gonna clamp that one down. The second one is V, which represents the black wire in my case. The next one is the grey wire, which represents EU. So I'm going to tighten that down. And these last two both connect to the ground terminal, which is FG. So now I'm going to connect these both at the same time, which might, which sometimes is generally a little bit tricky easiest way is to take this as far out as you can try and get them both in push them on nicely like that and clamp them down there we go so now we've successfully wired up the main terminals of our VFD here now before we turn anything on you want to double check everything it is hard to read all of these when the connectors are in place, but remember you have your diagram here as well. So we've got our neutral, which is our blue coming in from our mains plug. I've got the live, which is the brown coming in from our mains plug. We've then got our W, which represents brown for me, which is pin three, which is correct. We've then got the black, which represents V, which is pin two in my case. The gray then is U, which is pin one, and these two are ground or earth. So before we connect anything up to the spindle, you wanna first try and power this on. So I'm gonna close this lid here. Right, so I'm hooked up here to an extension lead because I have a very short DIY testing cable. Basically, we want to have the spindle disconnected here simply because if there's something wrong with the wiring or there's a problem in here somewhere and it's faulty, you don't want to end up damaging the spindle potentially. So keep it disconnected first time round. Double check your wiring as I said and then we're just going to turn it on. You should see this sort of boot up. And you'll have a display here with a flash in frequency. Now this ranges from 0 up to 400 hertz. So 400 hertz here would be full speed, which in this case is 24,000 RPM. And as you can imagine, you know, you go halfway. 200 hertz generally would be about 12,000, but that all needs calibrating. So we're going to turn it down to roughly a hundred or something like that and then we're going to hit run you should hear it sort of fire up the fan may kick in as well when you're doing this in this case you can see we've got an LED indicator that says run and basically to give you a quick rundown of how the interface works FR here is forward or reverse so you can control the direction of the spindle a display mode so if you press that it'll go through different parts here of this so you can adjust the frequency with buttons as opposed to the dial if you'd rather do that. Run and stop are pretty self-explanatory and then program and set. If you look in here it'll tell you all about this, how to use it, the different modes it has, how you can use them, what they mean. Go and have a good read of the manual. So now that we know this turns on, it doesn't blow up, doesn't seem to be anything wrong with it. You can hit stop. And that would spool down your spindle. And you can see there it's cut the power to it and our frequency is flashing again. So now what I'm going to do is switch this off. And notice that even when switched off and unplugged, this stays on for quite some time here. 
Similar to what I said about the power supplies in the previous video, the same is true here. So this is still holding charge. What you wouldn't really want to do is poke around in here directly after turning this off because there is still charge in there. You can see there's lights, LED still on. And you will notice in a moment that will turn off as you saw there. So there's a relay in there that just switches off, I imagine, when the voltage drops below a certain level. And the reason for that, if you look at the bottom in here, we have some serious capacitors in there. They are likely very high voltage capacitors and they're large, which means they can store a lot of charge. So again, be very careful if you disconnect this thing and then go immediately poking around in there. You, you, you wouldn't really want to do that. One way you can test to make sure there's no power, obviously, is to try and turn it on again. You see this sometimes with most electronic devices. TV, for example, you can switch a TV off with a remote, switch it off at the wall, and you'll see that the little red standby LED remains on, even though it's disconnected at the wall. And if you try to turn it on with a remote, it'll attempt to start up and then obviously crash because there's not enough power there. So same kind of thing here. You want to make sure that it's off before you go changing any wiring if you need to. If you do it correctly, you shouldn't have to go in there again and, and mess with any of that. So now what we'll do is we'll hook this up to the spindle and we'll give it a test. Right, so now we're at the spindle here. And if you take this top cap off, you'll see what I talked about. We've got the male end of this connector with a thread on it so that we can safely secure this down to the top connector. Now these here are for the water cooling. We're not gonna connect that up yet, but we can very briefly test it without having any cooling connected. What you wouldn't wanna do is connect this up and have it running at full speed for a significant period of time because this will overheat. These things can generate quite a lot of heat, so you need to be able to cool them efficiently. So this connector here, if you can see, has notches in it, which match up to the notches in our other end here. So all you simply do is just, you know, pop it in there. You'll see it'll just fit straight down. And then you want to clamp it down like this. That way it can't be yanked out. You want to make sure that's done up nice and tight as well. And ideally you'd have something up here which sort of manages these cables nicely so that they're not being pulled. Right, so we've got this all hooked up here. We've got our mains input in, and we've got our inverter output to the spindle, and we're gonna test it out. Now, the first thing I'd recommend you do is take off the nut here at the end, because we don't wanna test this and have that fly off and whack you in the face. Generally, these are loose when they arrive, so if you haven't tightened it up yet, there's obviously no collet or no bit anywhere near this. So we don't need that on for the moment. So from here, we can turn on our VFD, just like before. I'm gonna turn the frequency all the way down to start with. And I'm then gonna hit run. First thing we're gonna look for is our direction. We wanna make sure that we're going in the right direction. So in this case is clockwise. We want it to be turning clockwise. So if I turn this and listen, you should hear the spindle. Now these water-cooled units are very quiet compared to an air-cooled unit. So hopefully, you, well, I imagine you'll be able to hear it on camera. So there we go. Let me just check the direction there. Yep, so we're going the right way, so that's good. So I'm going to take it to 100 hertz, which is probably roughly 5,000 RPM. You can see it's very quiet. You can hear the spindles on, it's sounding good. And like I said, you wouldn't want to keep it on for too long because there's no water cooling. So once you've confirmed that it's working and that you can control the speed here, So I'm gonna hit stop here, which will spool that down and turn it off. Now generally these spindles 
it does say in the manual that when you first turn it on, you should let it sort of warm up first, let it run for 10, 15 minutes at a reasonable speed before using it to help aid in the longevity of it. These are sort of serviceable. They generally last a couple of years according to the manufacturer, depending on how much you use it. So there are ways you can optimize looking after this and ensuring that you get the longest possible lifespan out of the part. So there we go, that was a successful test. VFD's working, the spindle's working, we're able to control the speed successfully using the dial on the front here. And that's good enough for now. So we know everything works and we can proceed with the wiring as normal. So you might be thinking, well, that's great. It's nice that we can control it manually here, but what if we want to control it via the Mac 3 breakout board using software, right? And that is possible. It does require an additional board, which I don't have yet, but basically what you need is one of these. So this converts a PWM signal to an analog signal. And the reason we need one of them is because these connectors up here, I'll go through them in detail in another video. But basically, one of the common ways to control the spindle speed is via an external 10k potentiometer, similar to this one, probably a bit bigger. And basically, there's a 10 volt output on here, which goes to this board, which actually has a 10 volt pin and that's a 10 volt input, not a 10 volt output. A lot of people get confused about that. So we take our 10 volts out of here and it goes into our 10 volt input here. And that 10 volt input is so that that board has a reference voltage to control the other connectors on here. We've got ACM and AVI. So they are analog ground and analog output basically. So what you could do is connect pins up on here to a potentiometer so you could control the speed from somewhere else. So basically you don't want to be going into the electrical box all the time to adjust your speed, right? So what this lets you do is install an external potentiometer that you can wire in. And that could be on the outside of the control box. It could be somewhere else on the machine. Um, it could even be here if you really wanted it to just for you to be able to control the speed if that's your preferred method. Some people prefer being able to control the speed manually and externally from software and some people prefer to do it using the software if you want to issue commands and things like that. So basically I've seen a few people out there connect the PWM output of this board directly to the inputs here of the VFD. Now, that's not something I'd recommend doing. It seems to work for some people, but this is expecting an analog voltage to control the speed, which is what this is, right? This is an analog signal, which you control. You have an input, you have a ground, and the output voltage, which you determine by turning it. And I'm not sure how much you know about PWM and signals, but basically PWM signals are square waves. They have a duty cycle, which is the period of the signal. But the duty cycle represents how much of that period is on and how much of it is off. So for example, a 50% duty cycle would be half on and half off for that total period, which in this case is like setting the potentiometer to halfway at 50%. So PWM is a perfectly valid way of controlling these. However, I'd recommend you get a PWM to analog converter to interface between this board and the inputs here. So that's what I'm gonna do. I've got one of these on order. It's actually arriving tomorrow. I haven't got it here yet, obviously. So what I'm gonna do is in a completely separate video, I'll show you how to wire this up from this board to this board and then from this board to this board so that you could control the speed of the spindle from Mach 3. For now I'm leaving it like this. I'll also show you in that video as well how you can wire up a external potentiometer so that you can control this 
manually as well if you'd like to but in obviously an external environment to the control box so hopefully that's been useful and you'll be able to set this up and test it just to make sure everything's running so now what I'm going to do is go and test the water cooling system so I'm going to test the pump plumb these in and just run some water through it initially to make sure that it's all flowing it does get extremely cold here in the workshop sometimes it'll get as low as one to two degrees with a small heater on if I didn't have a heater it would definitely get below freezing in here and in that case you have to be careful um, you might want to use like an antifreeze mixture or something to prevent any damage potentially in any of the piping or tubing which could cause electrical faults and failures somewhere else so just be aware of that right so you can just see here I've installed the electric box up here on the wall behind the machine and if I open it up for you I've taken the main stainless steel plate out as well and I've got that mounted on four shelf brackets each of those has three heavy duty screws in them it also has four screw holes inside to connect it to the back here so that should be plenty to hold that up Basically, I think that's going to be the best place for it. One, because it's up out of the way. If I have it on the back of the frame down here, it means the machine kind of has to sit out a bit. And I'm very limited for space here in my small workshop. So I'm always looking for ways to save space where I can. I've also got my main consumer unit right down below this box as well. So that's a nice feed straight in. And it means I can have this whole box on its own breaker in the consumer unit. That way, if anything goes wrong in here, it's not going to mess with anything else in the workshop. So I think that's probably the way to go. And to be honest with you, it's got me thinking a bit as well about the best potential setup in terms of my cabling. Now, I did buy these drag chains. And these are great. You know, they're useful in that they're able to neatly move the cables back and forth wherever they need to go but also I'm thinking of installing some kind of boom arm for a dust extraction system that I could DIY and mount it to the frame here so with that you know if the dust extraction has got to follow the whole machine around in terms of the z-axis here you know it's got to be able to reach all the way over here and the cables as well right so part of me is just thinking if I have the cables run along a boom arm and go straight into the box that way I've got no cables sort of hanging down here anywhere nothing running off to the side because all I'll ever have to access is the z-axis motors at the back and obviously the cables to the spindle and stuff will need to make their way up and be held in place so I think as long as I could have these so that they're able to reach I could sort of safely have these along the top same goes with a water system as well so from what I've seen the water tube is quite thick and not very flexible so it's hard to get that in the drag chain so that's just kind of where my mind's at at the moment they're things that I'm thinking about but we'll see you know I'm doing this as I go I'm just happen to be sharing it with you guys as well so I may change my mind I don't know um, but I'm trying so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to cut a board that I can insert in there bolt it down to those standoffs and from there I'm going to have a go at installing some of the electronics so there we go guys you can see I've managed to just cut a board get it in there nothing too special just a bit of scrap OSB that I had lying around I haven't completely fixed this to the wall yet it's standing on the brackets I've got one screw holding it back the reason for that mainly is because I have to drill some holes in this obviously for routing cables and I want to put a fan in here as well so that's going to require a larger hole and I just in that case want to be able to easily remove it take it over to the other side of the shop and just do whatever I need to do but it's all looking good so far there's a removable plate at the bottom here as well which allows you to take that out drill the holes and have cables coming up from the underneath so like I said before I'll probably have my mains coming in right at the bottom here 
we'll see how it goes. So that's that kind of sorted. I'm happy I've got that on the wall. Now I can really start planning out how I want to do my wiring. And from there I can start thinking about getting everything set up, getting the NEMAs in. I've already got the Z one in here as you can see. I still need to do the Y and the X axis. So there we go, it's really getting there now. And we should have this thing up and running very soon. Right, so I've taken the board out of the enclosure here because I'm trying to get a better idea of how I really plan to lay this thing out. So I think I'm going to do something like this where on the side of the control box I'm going to have my emergency stop, my two gang switch which I've talked about before. The VFD actually mounts onto these rails here which is really nice. They can go right next to the fuses. I think I'm actually going to end up having three fuses not two because I'm going to fuse the mini PC separately. Again that makes more sense. So I'm going to have three different circuits going on which is nice. And now I need to just be as efficient as I can up here with the wiring. One of the advantages of that control box is it's quite high, right? So I've got height to my advantage. So for example, with a mini PC here, what I might do is 3D print a bracket so that I can secure that down to the board, but then also have a frame around that so that I can mount my control board on top of it. That way I can wire directly from the Mac 3 board straight into the USB port and then route all the other connections where necessary. So on the top left side of the control box here, what I plan to do is for each motor, we obviously have a motor connector and an encoder connector. So I plan to have the physical connectors on the side of the enclosure here so that I can quick connect and quick disconnect the machine from the control box. So rather than have these route in and be fixed manually, I'm going to have the inputs and outputs here come straight to the correct port. For the encoder I'm going to use a 6 pin connector just like this one and obviously for the motors you use the 4 pin. I'm also going to do the same for the sensors. The sensors are only 3 wire so I'm going to have 3 pin connectors for those. And I'm also going to have another one for the spindle which is going to be a big 10 amp connector like you've seen on the top of the spindle. So that's going to be my plan going forward. I've also received delivery here of the device that I talked about that acts as a sort of middleman between the Mac 3 board and the VFD. So what this does is it takes a PWM signal in and outputs an analog voltage of equivalent value. And that's going to make sure that we can communicate properly with the VFD and we're not just trying to drive a PWM signal straight in there. So there we go, that's where we're at. I've got a lot of thinking to go and do now, a lot of planning and preparation to get this all wired up neatly and efficiently. So there we are guys, that's where I'm at at the moment. It's really coming along now. We've tested all the hardware, everything's working. That gives me good confidence to crack on with doing the wiring, which is what I'm gonna do in the box here behind me. As you can see, I've taken the OSB board out and I've got it down on the bench here. I'm still trying to figure out the best way to wire it up. You can see now I've got delivery of the Intel Nook, which is a little mini PC that I also plan to have in here so that it can all be contained within this one unit. There's still a few things I've got on order at the moment. One of the things I'm planning to do is have connectors here on the side of the control box that will let me quick disconnect all of the hardware. So I want to have more of these sort of four pin and six pin switches for the encoder and the motors. And I'm going to have extension cables coming from the existing motors so that I can just plug straight into the control box. So the box itself will all be wired up and ready to go and nothing in there is going to have to change. But to have the ability, like this for example, if I want to pull the machine out, move it out of the way to potentially do some more work here, I don't want to have permanent cables hooked in here that have been directly wired to terminals. What I want is a nice quick disconnect so I can say, right, I want to move the machine, pull them out, and away it goes. That way I think it's the most modular approach and it's gonna just allow me more flexibility in the future. So that's what I plan to do there. The downside of that of course is I've had to order those parts. They're gonna take a few days to arrive, but it means I wasn't able to do that in this video. 
but that's okay I mean I think we're over 30 minutes here anyway hopefully you appreciated the breakdown of the VFD and the spindle demo now I'm gonna go away for the next few days try and figure out the best approach here for the wiring and then I'll document the installation of all of this inside the control box so as always I hope you enjoyed the video thanks for tuning in please do share these videos you know I'm trying to get this out to as many people as I can if you've got any friends that love this type of stuff and they'd be interested in my content just give it a share you know share it on your Facebook or your socials I'd really appreciate that remember come and join the discord channel as well if you want to get involved in some discussion there's a few people in there that are really interested in what we're doing here thanks for your time today and I'll see you in the next video